Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Tuesday. Great show planned for you. Awesome show. We'll hear from some of our contributors. I'm going to spend a lot of time, though. Uh, I'm wearing Baltimore Ravens purple right now because I'm about to unpack uh, the Michael Orr uh, story that swept the media, and now the media is all running from it and trying to act like it didn't happen yesterday. I, I, <laughs> I turned on ESPN this morning like, oh, can't wait to see how they unpack this Michael Orr deal. Maybe they'll give me uh, some material to work with. And I was severely disappointed. They did not uh, follow up. But I'm going to follow up because this Michael Orr story is uh, quite interesting. So uh, let's get into it. Let's start this fire. Uh, The 2009 movie, The Blind Side, does not state or imply the Tui family adopted Michael Orr. Neither does the 2006 Michael Lewis written book that inspired the film that earned Sandra Bullock an Oscar award. In 2011, when Michael Orr published his first memoir, I Beat the Odds, he stated directly that the Orrs secured a conservatorship when he was a senior in high school. He wrote that Sean and Leanne Tui insisted that he maintain a relationship with his biological mother and 11 siblings, or wrote that his mother participated in the procedures necessary for the Tuies to become conservators. Why on earth is Michael Orr pretending he only recently discovered the Tui family didn't adopt him? Why are members of the media going along with Orr's effort to shake down the Tui family for cash under the pretense that they lied to and exploited him for profit. Yesterday, Orr, a former NFL offensive lineman, filed a petition in a Tennessee court arguing that the Tuies earned millions of dollars from the blind side in the false belief that they adopted him. He claims that he earned nothing from the movie and that the Tuies owe him millions. This made headlines across corporate and social media. Twitter feeds overflowed with allegations that the Tuies had profited from Hollywood's love affair with the white savior trope. None of this made any sense to me. So uh, guess what I did? I mean, just sit back. I mean, you're not gonna believe what I did. I mean, because we just don't do this in modern journalism anymore. I did some research. Round of applause for me, I did some research. I mean, journalists just don't do that. So you know what I did? I went and read, cover to cover, Michael Orr's 2011 book, I Beat the Odds. Then I rewatched the movie, The Blind Side. Imagine that. I actually wanted to get informed and try to understand what is going on here. How can this feel good story turn into this nightmare? What, what? I I wanted to know what was being said a decade ago, long before social media had made it wildly popular to decide all conflicts based on racial dynamics. Michael Orr is black, the Tuies are white. The Blind Side was a real-life, feel-good movie about a wealthy white couple providing a home for a homeless black teenage boy in Memphis. The movie was an offshoot of Michael Lewis's book, which was an exploration of the importance of the left tackle position in the aftermath of linebacker Lawrence Taylor's career terrorizing quarterbacks. Just So just understand this. The book that this movie was based on was about Lawrence Taylor and the left tackle position in the NFL. That sounds very boring, doesn't it? But you gotta remember who Michael Lewis is. He also did that baseball movie Moneyball about the Oakland Athletics and how they worked the the system to spend less money and compete. This this guy's really into the details and the minutia and all of that. And so he writes this book 
it was inspired. If you remember, uh, Joe Theismann got hurt by Lawrence Taylor, broke his leg and uh, basically ruined the rest of his career or whatever. And, and Lawrence Taylor's pass rushing ability had made the left tackle more important. Michael Lewis said, yeah, I'm gonna write a book about it. He just happens to be childhood friends, Michael Lewis, with Sean Tui. Tui had uh, Ors, uh, noticed Orr's unusual relationship with the Tuies, and he made that a part of the book. Hollywood, sensing an opportunity to return a profit. Producers zeroed in on the Orr and Tuies and ignored Lewis's larger narrative about Lawrence Taylor and left tackles. Hollywood producers are smart. It was a smart decision. The Blind Side rocked the box office, earning $300 million. People like stories about people helping each other. They love hard luck. Oh, look at this feel good story. This kid, he's homeless and the two he's adopting him or, I'm sorry, they don't adopt him. They make him a legal guardian. They bring him into their home and they help him along the path. And for the most part, this movie, this Hollywood produced movie, it was accurate. It did not lie about the Tuies adopting Orr midway through the two hour film. In a quest to secure then 17 year old Michael Orr's driver's license, Sean and Leanne Tui sought to become Orr's legal guardian. A state social worker informed Leanne that she could obtain guardianship of Orr without the permission of Orr's biological mother. Unsatisfied with that information, Leanne hunted down the boy's mother and visited her in her ghetto home. The movie shows the two chatting about Michael's father and whether Miss Orr wanted to see her son. And then in the next scene, the entire Tui family, mom, dad, daughter, and son, they're sitting around uh, the dining room table with Michael. This six foot four, 300 pound black dude. And Sean, the dad, told Michael that they would like to become Michael's legal guardian. Michael asked what that meant. Leanne replied, we want to know if you'd like to become a part of this family. That's it. That's what the, that's what the movie did. It never said he was adopted. I'm reading all these ESPN stories and all these stories. Oh my God, there's just been this great lie and Hollywood and everybody pretending and immortalized the story about how Michael Orr was adopted by this family. The movie doesn't do it, the book doesn't do it. And in 2011, Michael Orr wrote his own book and he said it didn't happen. What is Michael Orr doing? What he's doing to the Tui family is despicable. He's telling an obvious lie that he knows most of the media will be too afraid to question because he's black. Plus, the media is lazy. It's easier to repeat Orr's allegations than to question and or research the legitimacy of them. It's also easier to just feel sorry for Michael Orr. He's broken. The first 15 of his years of his life are a tragedy. That's not my opinion. Read his book. His, his own words. His mother was addicted to crack cocaine and birthed a dozen children with a variety of men. Or, and his siblings would routinely come home and find the door locked, their mother nowhere to be found. She would disappear for days, ingesting cocaine with friends. Her kids, as young as 14 months, would be left locked out of their apartment, forced to beg for food and a couch to sleep on. This was a regular pattern. That type of neglect causes lifelong trauma. Orr met his father but had no relationship with him. His grandmother hated him. State social workers eventually intervened. Or move from foster home to foster home, school to school, from one friend's couch to the next. At the time of his 2011 book, after being dissatisfied with his portrayal in The Blind Side, Orr reached the conclusion that he wasn't getting nearly enough credit for his rags to riches NFL story. 
in his book, I Beat the Odds, or argued that at the age of seven, he watched Michael Jordan slay the Phoenix Suns in the 1993 NBA Finals, and he crafted a plan to become a professional athlete. This man wrote in a book, a grown man wrote in a book. But yeah, when I was seven, I saw Michael Jordan put it on Charles Barkley and the Phoenix Suns, and yeah, I decided I'm gonna be a professional athlete. Seven-year-old Michael Orr saved Michael Orr. Not the Tuies or anyone else. The Tuies and everyone else simply assisted Orr execute his plan. He planned to be the next Michael Jordan. He wound up being a solid eight-year NFL lineman. For years, Michael Orr has complained. The blind side made him look stupid, like he couldn't read before tutors in high school taught him. He has expressed frustration that the movie suggested the Tui's young son taught him football and that Leanne coerced him into being aggressive. Michael Orr wants credit. I get it, I really do. He wants to be the star and hero of his own movie. Most people do. Orr lacks self-awareness, humility, and quite possibly intelligence. Making $34 million as an average professional athlete will certainly create some delusion. At six foot four and 300 pounds, Orr fancied himself as the next Michael Jordan or Charles Barkley. He had to be talked into focusing on football when he was in high school. The man thinks hatching a scheme to be a pro athlete at age seven was a sign of brilliance and vision. Michael Orr, if you're watching this, if someone sends this to you, you hatched a ghetto dream that 99.9% .9 of the time leads to utter failure. Michael Orr, where would you be today had you stopped growing at five foot nine inches like most American men? Where would you be without the Tuies? They provided the stable home where a tutor could come work with you every day so you could catch up academically. By your own admission, and I beat the odds, you never attended school regularly until you enrolled at Briarcrest Christian School as a sophomore in high school. You, you think you just showed up and you were Einstein? Michael Orr is so arrogant and delusional that he believes his natural intellect would have developed regardless of circumstances. It's a naive worldview. He's still naive. He believes this desperate attempt to shake down the family that welcomed him into their home is a good look and is going to lead to a financial windfall. It's not. As lazy as the media is, as lazy as reporters and pundits are, they're going to have to deal with the truth. The Tuies were wealthy when they took legal guardianship of Orr. They sold their family business for $200 million. They had no financial motive to exploit Orr. They exercised no control over his professional career. I, let me give you this example, and this is, I'm picking this up because I just did homework. I just read this man's own 2011 book. He wrote, he told, the two he's a longtime friends with NFL super agent Jimmy Sexton. The Tuies wanted Orr to sign with Jimmy Sexton when he left Ole Miss for the NFL. Orr, by his own admission, chose a different agent. The Tuies didn't object. He made a mistake. This agent he chose wasn't as good as Jimmy Sexton, had him working out, preparing for the draft with Michael Johnson, the Olympic sprinter, and this guy's an offensive lineman. And eventually, Michael Orr figured it out. Hey, I picked the wrong agent. Maybe I should reconsider and sign with an NFL super agent who's best friends with the family that welcomed me into their home. He walked back to Jimmy Sexton. But again, 
they're putting out this whole exploitive conservative ship nonsense like it's Britney Spears' parents controlling all of her money. Michael, reporters, the world, the Tuies have and always have had more money than Michael Orr. They also have more class, decency, and compassion than Orr. Sean Tui says he still loves Michael Orr. He, he denies all of this and basically, I don't need his money. We didn't make a bunch of money off this movie. And what we did make, we split five ways. Their side makes perfect sense. Here's the deal that everybody's gonna have to come to grips with. Michael Orr is every bit as emotionally broken as the first day as an overgrown teenager, he slept on the Tui's couch. That's my fire starter. Think this through. It makes perfect sense. You would be emotionally broken too if for the first 15 years of your life, and you got 11 siblings and your mother spitting out kids every nine months with some different dude. You don't know your father. You're living in the ghetto in one of the most violent cities in America. And you don't know, and I'm I'm, this is based off his own book, read it for yourself. I read it in a night. It's easy to read. It's very straightforward. Don Yeager, uh, uh, a very prominent sports writer, author, written a lot of great sports books, helped him write it. But it's written in first person, straight from uh, Michael Orr. Read it for yourself. This young boy, it was routine for he and his siblings to come home from whatever they would do. They could be out playing. They could be coming home from school if they went to school that day. They, they'd come home and the door would be locked. They couldn't get into their apartment. And it was so routine that they were like, oh, mama's on one again. Might be back in two or three days after the crack runs out. Let's scatter into the wind. Let's all go find a friend whose couch we can sleep on or whose floor we can sleep on, or whose food we can beg for. I'm reading this man's own book, his own words. This was commonplace. Do you not understand what kind of trauma that would create in a child? That if not addressed, and based on this book I'm reading, based on the movie that I saw, in the movie, uh, Sean Tui, the, the dad, and, and Mike says it in the book that, you know, the saying was Mike's greatest strength is his ability to forget. That he just, all the hardship and trauma that he's gone through, he just moves on and moves past it and, and pretends like it never happened. Well, now we're finding out he can't pretend like it never happened. It's left deep scars on this man unaddressed scars. This man needs years of therapy. Maybe he's gotten it. I don't know. But by the looks of it, I don't see it. He's lashing out at people who tried to help him. He, the only speculation, and this is speculation, everything else I just told you, like, this is straight from his book, this is from watching a movie, this is from doing research, but I haven't seen, the, the first thing that ran through my mind is like, is this dude broke? What's, what's, what's he whining about? Oh, they didn't adopt me and I would, have, I would have had rights if I was adopted. Rights to what, an inheritance? Or that $200 million they, they got for that family business? They owe you that? Because you moved into their house as a senior in high school and they told you I love you? And they told everybody, yeah, that's my adopted son or my play son or blah, blah. They owe you that? I mean, let's be real. They went above and beyond. 
I mean, I read this story yesterday, and then after doing the research, I was just like, no good deed goes unpunished. I, I've, I've seen this. I've experienced this firsthand. It's the very people you help the most without any expectation of anything in return. Those are the very people who will turn on you and trash you at every turn. I've seen big and smaller versions of this repeatedly. I've experienced it in my own life. No good deed goes unpunished. And that's why when you do good deeds, don't expect, eliminate all expectations that it will be reciprocated. And that's not a negative statement about the people you're helping. It's about being in the right mindset so that you're doing things for the right reason and you won't be disappointed when people do not show an ounce of gratitude. That's not me being bitter. That's just me telling you what life has taught me. And that there's parts of this I understand completely as it relates to Michael Orr. When, when you accomplish something great or anything in your life, you do want credit. And, and when you, uh, any person has a natural instinct of, hey, when I show up, when I meet someone, when I'm at a party, when I'm engaging with people, I, I want them to be interested in me. I'm interested in them. I don't want to be overshadowed by a family member, a friend, a spouse, a girlfriend, a boyfriend. People have those feelings. And, and so Michael Orr shows up and people want to, hey, I want to talk about the movie. Hey, what's the Tui family like? Oh, that, that woman that played Sandra Bullock that was your mother or whatever. And, and he's having to talk about them and what they did for him instead of talking about what he wants to talk about, what he did for himself. I get it. But you got to have enough maturity, self-awareness, and gratitude and a strong enough relationship with God that you're not looking for that. And it takes some discipline and some maturity and, and, and to get in a real place. And I understand most people can't get there. Everybody struggles with this. But this man should be writing books and on doing interviews and telling anybody he runs into, man, what God did for me. Holy cow. My mother, my father did nothing for me. And God sent all these people, including the Tui's, including this Miss Sue who was his tutor, including the Tui's daughter, including the, the, the students at the school that in his own words, in his own book, he's going to some private Christian school with a bunch of mostly white kids and they treated him great. Those are his words in 2011, before social media turned everything into a race war. He should be on his knees and anything that falls out of his mouth should be, man, God has been good to me. Lord have mercy. I was homeless. I was six foot four, 300 pounds, and God put it on the hearts of some white, rich couple with a 16, 17 year old daughter to let my big butt in their home with their daughter, who's the same age or in the same school as, as me. Who does that? Whether the guy's black, white or whatever, who brings a six foot four, 300 pound person into their home with their daughter, and I, oh, they just want him to play an old Miss. This is an offensive tackle, cut it out. This ain't Lamar Jackson, this ain't Dan Marino, this ain't a quarterback, this is an offensive tackle. He ain't gonna make a dip, bit of difference at Ole Miss, and I don't care, he could have been Willie Rofe and uh, 
was Anthony Munoz combined. Ole Miss wasn't winning no national championship or, or whatever because Michael Orr showed up. This guy's lack of self-awareness is mind-blowing, but, but I get it. People want to be the stars of their own movie. I'm, I'm going to, I want to be, because all of this stuff I can relate to on a very personal level. Family members that I was close to. Family members that I brought into my own home and raised as my own. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but it's just the truth. Anybody that's followed my career for a long time knows when I was in Kansas City, I brought one of my cousins to Kansas City to live with me to get him up out of the ghetto gang lifestyle. His mama was my first cousin, loved his, love his mama, grew up like brothers and sisters, but she had a drug problem. And all of this stuff I'm reading in Michael Orr is what I heard from my cousin, all my cousins, same thing going on. Come home, mama not there. All of it. I heard it all. And so uh, there's a lot of this story I relate to. And then on the, on, the, on the end, on the spectrum of him wanting credit. And th that's a natural human instinct and wants to talk about himself and wants credit for what he did. I, I get it. Because... I'm going to say something. I hope it's understood, and I hope if, if my brother watches this, I hope I unpack this properly. Because this has never been an issue with me and my brother, but it's something I think about all the time. And I will tell anybody that I ever meet, everybody hears it fall out of my mouth, my brother is 10 times the person that I am. He's, he's the best human being I know. Tremendous to me, just from a little kid all the way through, just tremendous to me. Because I was the cut up, the class clown, I was constantly in trouble. I was, I was doing stuff I wasn't supposed to do, but I got all of the attention, particularly once I started developing as an athlete. And so many things in my family, we're based on, oh, Jason's playing a football game. Jason's got a track beat. Jason's uh, uh, on the basketball team. Jason's doing this. Jason's doing that. And all, then it turned, oh, Jason's going to be a scholarship football player. And we'll go to the games. And Jason's going to be written about in the newspaper and blah, blah. And my brother was not an athlete. And my brother was less of a personality than me. And all the attention we were kids, because either I was in trouble or I was doing something great on the athletic field, all the attention was on me. And, I, and as I got older, I started thinking, like, oh, wow. My whole family talks about me since 12, 13 years. It's not that they didn't talk about my brother, but it wasn't the volume because he wasn't getting written about in the newspaper. He wasn't the captain of a nationally ranked high school football team. He wasn't getting a football scholarship and all that. And then after the football thing ends at the mid-major level at Ball State, then out of nowhere, three, four years after college, now all of a sudden I'm a, a sports writer getting all this national attention, being on ESPN, winning awards, and, and I, I'm, I'm the center of a lot of conversation become nationally known, and my brother looks like a mini version of me. And obviously we carry the same last name. And I've always thought about, man, my brother when he goes to work, He's got to deal with my baggage. I write something controversial that he doesn't know anything about, doesn't want to, <laughs> doesn't have an opinion on it. He's got his own life, wife, kids, the whole thing. But then also people want to ask him about me. Did you see what your brother did? Did you see what your brother said? Did, well, hey, are, are you Jason Whitlock's brother, blah, blah, blah. And, and my brother loves me as much as I love him. But damn, it, it, I would imagine, he's never complained to me, but it's like, talking about me all the time? 
Who wants to do that? I, I get it. I ran in. I, problem I had, and people at the Kansas City Star think that completely unaware. But in 2010, when I left Kansas City and left the newspaper industry, one of the things I had figured out was like many of my coworkers didn't like me because they had to spend too much time talking about me away from work. And, and I'm not bad mouthing them. I'm not doing it because it would get old. If, if you are someone <clears throat> that works at the Kansas City Star and before Jason Whitlock showed up, you'd go to a party and socialize with your friends and you'd say, hey, I cover the University of Kansas uh, football and basketball team. And someone at dinner, oh, that's fair. Hey, what's that like? What do you, hey, what's Roy Williams like? What's Bill Self like? What's so-and-so or blah, blah, blah. And how long you been doing that? And then all of a sudden, I show up, and I'm getting all the attention. And people, you show up at the party, and people are less interested in what you do as opposed to asking you, hey, what's that Jason Whitlock like? Hey, why did Jason Whitlock write X, Y, or Z? Hey, wh wh why, why did he defend Don Imus and criticize rappers? Things that many of my, they didn't want to talk about. They're too uh, polarizing of topics. They're too controversial. They're all hot water for them, particularly when I wrote about race and issues along those lines. And they're like, oh man, if, you know, if I say this or say that, I could get in trouble. It just gets old and I get it and that's where I think is driving quite a bit of what's going on with Michael Orr. He wants to go places and be the star of the Michael Orr movie and and to some degree he is. I mean he played in the NFL and all this but he's tired of talking about the Tuies. That you can pick up on that a little bit in his 2011 book because he celebrated a lot of other people while still celebrating the Tuies, but he was pointing to all these other different people that helped him along the way. And, and, and he was basically saying, it was like, the Tuies were great, but there was a lot of people that helped me. And so here he is now, I think perhaps broke. He's just had it up to here. And he's got another book he's trying to sell. And, and so now he's out doing interviews. I want to play the clip of uh, Michael Orr. <clears throat> I think he was talking to Damon Amendolar. I, I, I sent you all this clip. He's talking to Damon Amendolar. Maybe Damon's sitting in for Jim Rome. I, I can't remember. But uh, here he is talking about how he was not portrayed correctly in the blind side. And you just said you, you feel like you've been mislabeled sometimes, misunderstood. And I think, at least from what I've read, read in the book, a lot of that stems from how you were portrayed in the movie The Blind Side. And that people might have the wrong idea of your personality, number one. That you were this kind of shy wallflower. <laughs> that you were timid and you had to be kind of like drawn out of your shell when in reality... You were a workaholic, you were hyper-organized, and you were like, damn it, I'm making something of myself no matter what it takes after a rough background. Is that, is that the, the big one that you feel you were mislabeled as? I think it took away the hard work and the dedication that I created uh, from a child and going to school in the third grade, getting myself up, first one in the locker room, last one out, uh, and... I think the biggest for me is, you know, being portrayed, uh, not being able to read or write. Uh, second grade, I was doing plays and for in front of the school. And I, I think that's one of the, when you go into a locker room and your teammates don't think that you can learn a playbook, you know, that weighs heavy uh, on someone. You, you know, and you have to understand, I understand that, the movie it has given me a position. I'm honored to have the position it's given me, but you know you have to understand. Before I moved in with the family, I was an all-American. That's what I want the generations behind me to see in this book right here to understand that you don't have to come have someone save you and rescue you to go out and be successful. You got every tool 
uh, in you. And this book right here is a playbook on life. You know, looking yourself in the mirror when I was 11, 12 year old kid, telling myself, hey, everyone's around, everyone around you is even in an even worse situation that you're in. So you're going to have to get up and do this thing yourself. And this man needs a biblical perspective and some humility. I mean, it's, it's, it's embarrassing that he's this age. And again, that's an interview he did with Damon Amendolar. That was done before this lawsuit thing went public. But it's been in the past week or two. But him complaining about not getting the credit. I got up in third grade and got myself to school. Yes, you did. But I read your 2011 book. He did that some of the time. Not the overwhelming majority of time, but some of the time. You were, it's in the movie, it's in your book, in your own words, you were a runner. You would get in foster homes, get dissatisfied, run back home to your mama at, at Hurt Village, in the hood, in the projects, and disappear for two and three weeks at a time. And this whole, the people saying, I couldn't read. I was do, he didn't say, I was reading that blah, blah, blah. I was doing plays, is what he said. Brother, any time from age zero in the womb, your mama wasn't reading to you in the womb, I'm going to make that assumption. Your home life, based on your whole book, she wasn't reading to you then. You skipped an overwhelming majority of school all the way up until you were a sophomore at this private school. You had some catch up to do academically. A lot of catch up. And so maybe you think you were reading at a proficient level, but those educators and everybody else, you're like, wow, this dude's got to catch up to the rest of us. And they provided you that help and hats off to you for accepting that help. But 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 miss me with everybody, the guys in the locker room thinking I couldn't learn the playbook that hurt me. Stop it, man. Hell, there's a high percentage of guys in that locker room that, that graduated and went to school every day, but they went to school to chase girls or play basketball or football, and they can't read. Hey, that ain't what's going on in the locker room. Cut it out. Cut it out. And by that time at Ole Miss, you had already uh, been on the dean's list a few times. People had done the homework. You had, you had played catch up, and, and you had done a lot of work to catch up. Hats off to you. But someone making a movie about a small slice of your life, the, the movie starts with you as a 15-year-old sophomore or however, however old you were as a sophomore, and you expect it to catch, it's a two-hour movie, and it's, you expect it to catch the totality of your life. They show what you were like at 15 and 16 years old. You had to play catch up with everybody else. Your academic record spoke for itself. This, every aspect of this I can relate to personally. I know the stories. I'm going to tell this story. I'm going to leave the name out of it. I'm going to leave the school out of it. Very close to a young man. Very close. That was a great athlete and was basically homeless and parentless uh, like Michael Orr growing up in the Midwest. I'm not gonna put it state or city, in the Midwest. He missed a lot of school all the way up until his junior year. And he showed a great kid, finally gets into the right home environment, not adopted, but someone took legal, legal guardianship of him, and they, he's a great athlete, and they finally get him situated in a home environment where he could be a student and an athlete. And it's like, oh my God, this kid's got big time talent. And he's not some big old guy, but everybody can see he's got big time talent. 
And so he had to play catch up academically because basically he skipped his freshman and sophomore years academically. And the, the school principal and the administrators liked this kid so much, saw that this kid was trying, they go back in and redo his grades from his freshman and sophomore year so that he could qualify for a football scholarship. They just remake, redo his grades from his freshman and sophomore year. And then when he gets to college, he can barely read, barely read. And when I say barely, probably can't read. And the coaches and the coaches' wives wrap their arms around this kid and for four years poured every bit of energy they could into helping him play catch up in college. They everything they could. And the kid worked hard too and played catch up. And he eventually graduated. I could go on story after story after story. This kid appreciative and not running around going, hey, I deserve all the credit. And how come people aren't celebrating me? No, this now grown man understands. And he's around Michael Orr's age. They may be identical in age. It's like, oh, my God. The people God put into my life to help me make it. Hats off to them. Hats off to God. Thank you so much. That's where Michael Orr needs to be. Not looking for credit. Not trying to sue some people for some money. This is a shakedown, a racial shakedown. The, 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 I think, do we have a clip? I think the son, Sean Tui Jr. I think we got a clip of him basically saying there was a text message exchange between the family that, that shows that like, hey man, this is a load of garbage and BS and that he was threatening them via text message that there was X amount of dollars that he wanted or he was going to take this thing public. I think we have that clip, let's play it. So, so the number one things he's saying, the, the conservatorship versus the adoption, I know you talked a little bit about Kevin, like what is your take on, on that's the main claim, right? And, and pretty recent, as February 2023 is when Michael says he realized the difference and what it meant. Like, what did you... But, but wait, you even, even before you answer that, if you're saying this is like his... There's been multiple lawsuits regarding this not against, not against like the Not against the family specifically, but to the movie companies and all that kind of stuff. I believe this is not the first... Got it. Uh, okay. Go around. Okay. So, so he, had, he had issues, was, was suing other entities, then finds out that he wasn't technically adopted, but it's a conservatorship, and that's when he puts you guys in the, in the crosshairs. Again, I don't, I don't want to speak to things here. Well, let me, I'm going to preface in case someone says this, this, this freaking guy, I'm not going to listen to him anymore. I'm, I'm going to preface by saying that um, I, I love Mike at 16. I love Mike at now he's, what, 16 and a half years old, 37. Um, and I love him at 67. So there, there's not going to be any legal dossier or, or um, thing that happens that's going to maybe, you know, go like, screw that guy. It's, it's not the case. I'll, I'll be mad at him. Um, but to your initial point, no, I mean, I, if he says he learned that in February, I find that hard to believe. There's, it's, I went back to my text today to look at, uh, I was curious today randomly to go back to look at our family group texts and, and text to see what things had been said. And there were things back in 2020, 2021 that they were like, you know, if you guys give me this much, then I won't go public with things. And um, so I don't know that's true. I think everyone learned in the past year about the, the conservatorship stuff because of Britney Spears. So maybe that's the case. Um, but I, I don't, I mean, it doesn't. That's my point. The whole Britney Spears and the use of the word conservatorship, it created an opportunity for Michael to throw that out there and to pretend like he was exploited. Again, this man has been in control of his own life and own decision making pretty much since he was three or four years old. Go read his book. He went to school when he wanted. He ran away from homes when he wanted. He lived with his mama when he wanted. He went from house to house to house to house to house. 
when he didn't want to take Jimmy Sexton as an agent, he made that decision. There's no allegations here that they were negotiating his NFL contracts and bilking him out of money. This family's independently wealthy. This is one of the most despicable stories I've ever seen. It's, a t it's sad all the way around. This man is clearly broken, needs major counseling, and it's, it's, I just, <laughs> I look at it and, and it just hammers home just how complicated and how negative we've made racial things here in America. If, if, if social media over the last 10 to 12 years hasn't, hadn't changed the racial dynamic and, and Michael Orr didn't realize like, oh, I can basically blast this white family and try to bilk them out of money and social media is going to make the media back me up. Hey, I've seen Colin Kaepernick use this tactic employ. He goes after his adopted white parents and the media sells it and no one pushes back. Bubba Wallace gets to say, hey, they hung a noose in my garage and threatened to assassinate me. No one questions it. Everybody just goes along with it. Michael Orr is sitting around, I think perhaps financially broken or not living the life that he wants to live. Say, hey, that white family that showed me a lot of love when I was a young boy and no one in my entire family neglected me. Hey, they got a bunch of money and, and they seem happy and Mrs. Tui's brand is really strong and, and that movie was good to her. Uh, the movie, you know, didn't portray me the way that I wanted to be portrayed. Trust me, if they ever make a movie about me, I'll complain and say, hey man, why didn't y'all make me 50, 60 pounds lighter? I'm not that fat. That, despicable. I'm gonna bring on, Shamika Michelle's got some insight into this. I'm gonna bring her on. T.J. Moe has some insight, a story about uh, Dorio Green Beckham, the number one wide receiver in the country a few years ago that committed to uh, Mizzou from a similar background as, as Michael Orr, and he'll share how that turned out at Mizzou. Uh, before we get to them, I want to tell you guys about uh, my Patriot mobile phone that you know, I probably now had for six months. Uh, every day we hear about another familiar brand selling out their customers and going woke. You ain't got to worry about that with uh, Patriot Mobile. All, we talked about it last week. We talk about it all on the show, about all these global corporations and all these big companies. They're all in on this ESG crap. They're all in on this diversity, equity, inclusion. They're all in on the woke garbage, not Patriot Mobile. We have to establish a parallel economy and spend our money with companies that support our values. Patriot Mobile does that in spades. I've been completely satisfied and happy with my Patriot Mobile phone. It's been one of the greatest decisions I've ever met, made. I'm supporting a company that has my values. That's a con Christian conservative wireless provider offering dependable nationwide coverage on all three major networks you can get the exact same coverage as everyone else, minus the leftist propaganda. Make the switch to Patriot Mobile. I've done it. It's great for me. You'll be supporting the Second Amendment. You'll be supporting religious freedom, second sanctity of life. Our military veterans, first responders, the, the customer service team is all American, homegrown people. Keep your phone number. Keep your values, support a company that supports you, patriotmobile.com slash Jason, or call 878-PATRIOT. Get free activation today with the offer code Jason. Ask about their coverage guarantee while you're there. Get the same dependable service and take a stand for your values. Make the switch today, patriotmobile.com slash Jason, or 878-PATRIOT. All right, welcome back. I want to roll out to North Carolina, bring in Shamika Michelle, because we were talking this morning about Michael Orr, and Shamika has had experience, I think, with foster kids 
Uh, Shamika, I, w- I wanted you to share a couple of things we talked about this morning about uh, the kind of risk uh, that the Tui family was willing to take bringing Michael Orr into their home. Yes, Jason, when I saw this story and what he was doing, it immediately felt like a slap in the face to me. I've taken in two teenagers at different times. One was a young lady who I had no relation to, really. I was her high school coach. And then also a family member who was my second cousin. I took him in as well. And it just seems as though if people that have never done that don't understand the risk involved. Number one, with the young lady, my oldest biological child went from being the oldest child to having someone come in who was two and a half years older than she was, who needed extra attention, extra care. It really had an effect on her, made her feel like someone was taking her mom. And also, because this was a teenager, I had to pay special attention to make sure my husband was never in a position to be lied on. So it's not even just the person that says, hey, I'm going to open my heart and my home to you. It's also the family that's there that has to make huge adjustments. And so when this happens and these people come back and act as if this wasn't a great big deal for somebody to do this. It's really a slap in the face. When I took in the the young man, he was in high school and that was a big adjustment. I had a house full of females and fast forward 10 years when his brother was about eight years when his brother needed a place to stay. I had to say no, because at that time, my children were uh, my girls were older, you know. And so I just think for them to let this big you know, teenage guy come and live in their house, it's a big deal. It's not like, oh, just, hey, we got an extra room or, hey, here's a plate because we cooking. It's a lot that goes into this. And it's a big emotional deal as well for everybody involved. It's particularly, and you told me this morning too, just about when you have daughters and this family had a daughter the same age or in the same class as Michael Orr, that, that I'm just, I would have never done it. I, I'm just sorry. If I had a daughter, I just, I'm not letting another boy her age into my home. It's just too high risk. It's very high risk. And when I took in the teenage boy, my oldest child, they were the exact same age. They're, I think, six days apart, but they have been raised together on and off their entire life. Now, when it came to possibly bringing in his brother, there was a an age difference. Uh, they were My children were closer in age, but He had not been raised with us. Like my, we didn't know him. I knew that there were a lot of behavior issues. Their mom also dealt with drug addiction. So when these kids come in and they've been in this situation where they've been abandoned and left at home or sent to the babysitter or not had anything to eat and not properly cared for, they come in with a lot of emotional trauma. And so you do have to be careful. You know, my bedroom was downstairs, you know, having to really not sleep at night because you want to hear everything that that's going on. And so it's a it's a big deal, Jason. And when people do that, they're really putting themselves out there and possibly opening themselves up for, you know, the unknown, because you don't know how this person is going to come in. They've already been uh, had values instilled in them or maybe don't have values. You don't know because These aren't children that you birthed. You haven't had this type of influence on them. It's a lot. And so, of course, I'm not saying because you take a child in that gives you authority over their life and they have to worship and praise you, especially if, you know, you've mistreated them. But I do think when you have someone that does that for you, there should be a certain level of appreciation because it's a big deal. And so for him to come out now and act as if this wasn't a a big thing and this wasn't a huge sacrifice, it's just a complete slap in the face and no 
no child and especially no adult that at this time should know better should be doing that. He has some unhealed trauma, it sounds. He should be sitting in a counselor's office in somebody's chair or on their couch, not sitting trying to write a book and make money from that. He, it feels like he has some unhealed trauma and that has nothing to do with the family. That has everything to do with his mom, his blood. The first woman that's supposed to teach you how to love, the first woman that's supposed to be your biggest cheerleader, not being that to him. Thank you, Shamika. Uh, great job. Appreciate it. Uh, hey, guys, I want to tell you <laughs> about, you know, I've been fighting the battle of the bulge and, and winning. Uh, part of winning has been figuring out what type of cereal I can eat in the morning. I grew up, you know, loving, you know, a crunchy peanut buttery type cereal. Uh, when I was a kid, that was always my favorite. Magic Spoon has come up with a version of the peanut butter cereal that's low in carbs, no sugar. It's actually healthy. I've been able to add this to my eating routine, and it has really helped. It has filled that need and that longing for everybody loves cereal. Everybody loves cereal. Everybody grew up eating it as a kid. You, fit, you get my age, it's like, man, I can't have cereal anymore. It's all loaded with sugar. It's, you know, a minute on the lips, and it'll be 40 days on the hips and all that. Magic Spoon has four, a variety pack with four different flavors. You can, uh, uh, the pack, it's, it's peanut butter, it's frosted, it's cocoa puffs, it's fruity. It's, you can get it all. Mine just happens to be the peanut butter, and it's awesome. Zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, just four or five net carbs, only 140 calories per serving. It's high protein, zero sugar, keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free. Do yourself a favor. Check out Magic Spoon. I've done it. It's working for me. Go to magicspoon.com slash fearless. Fear, I'm sorry, magicspoon.com slash fearless5. Put the number, don't spell out five, fearless5 to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use the promo code fearless5 at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's back with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked, you don't gotta send the cereal back, just tell them you don't like it, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of high protein cereal at magicspoon.com slash fearless5, the number five, and use the code fearless5 to save $5 off. Thank you again for Magic Spoon for sponsoring this episode of today's episode of Fearless. Thank you so much, Magic Spoon. All right, uh, you can get your Fearless Army swag at shopblazemedia.com slash fearless. TJ Moe, next. All right, welcome back. Let's roll out to St. Louis, bring in T.J. Moe, the show me kid. T.J., of course, played at the University of Missouri. This morning when we were talking about Michael Orr, T.J. reminded me or was sharing with me a story about Dorio Green Beckham, number one wide receiver, big-time recruit, number one player in college, high school college football that signed with Mizzou. T.J. reminded me that uh, Green Beckham had a, a similar background to Michael Orr and it didn't go well at the University of Mizzou. TJ, uh, fill us in. Yeah, it, somehow his story may be even worse than Michael Orr's, if that's possible. I read this morning, I didn't know this at the time, his mother, when she was six months pregnant with Doriel, who I don't know if she knows the father, he doesn't know his father, never met him, when she was uh, six months pregnant with him, she got drunk, mixed it with crack, and... Uh, Demerol, which I don't even, I'm not familiar with it, but apparently uh, fairly lethal. And they saved You're her. You're familiar with crack cocaine, though? Is it, should we infer that you are familiar with crack since you didn't offer that disclaimer? 
I at least have heard of it. Have not heard of it. Oh, okay. But <laughs> apparently in a, it's a thing. Anyway, they didn't even detect a heartbeat uh, from in the pregnancy. And so they're like, we hope, but we have no idea. And so that's the sort of treatment he had in the womb. Not only was he not being read to, but he was almost being murdered. And so, you know, take that, which uh, particularly just a lot of these women who have, I would assume it's similar to Michael Orr. You got a whole bunch of different baby daddies and you, you spend your life on substance. What does that do to the kid in the womb? And so he had three, four, five siblings. And I, I, I know he's the only one who had a dad. I think several of them had different fathers. And so the type of things that I think he saw growing up wreck you for life. You know, it's like the violence that I just have to assume you see with alcohol and drug abuse and different dads inside the home at different times for short period of times and boyfriends. And so similarly, all the way up until the fourth grade, they moved all the time, got evicted. He lived in a van for a month or two, right? Just a miserable childhood. Finally, she put him up for adoption in the fourth grade. And, and it was probably even worse somehow in the foster program because it was he and two half brothers. I don't know if they all went together, but they would take some sometimes for one day and say, Hey man, this ain't going to work. And they'd move foster homes two weeks, one month, one day. So just destroyed. Um, and for him, it didn't work out so well. They, they did th- There was a white family who was the football coach at the, at, um, down in Springfield, Missouri Hillcrest. And in the eighth grade, Doriel asked, can we just live with you? And they adopted him. They actually adopted him into the family. Turned out Doriel was even a bigger recruit, the biggest recruit, certainly in the history of, of uh, Missouri. He was the number one recruit in the country. He, at the time, had set the all-time record for receiving yards for a wide receiver nationally for a period. 6,000 receiving yards. His senior year, he almost – uh, he almost caught more. He had 2,200 yards. That's, that's only about 300 yards less than I threw for as a quarterback. Just, I mean, it, unbelievable. If there was anybody that was going to take someone in and assume you might get rich off of them, you'd think it's maybe this guy. And he went to Mizzou. I was his mentor. You know, they assigned seniors with, um, freshman, actually, if you want some behind the scenes, deal, I may have told you this before. I'm the worst person you could possibly assign someone to, to take them out on an official visit and go have fun. I mean, the worst. And so I didn't even know what bars to go to, but it's like coach gave me some money and said, make sure we get him. And so we did actually the first night, one of the bars turned him away because he didn't have an ID. And the next night, every bar in town had a a sign out front that said DGB is welcome here. And obviously everybody in the town, including the police knew he was only 18 years old. Anyhow, his freshman year, this is where I think, you know, it destroyed him no matter who came in to help him. It destroyed him that he, he could not get away from the substance as a freshman got busted with weed in the, in the Mizzou parking lot, sitting with two other teammates, lighted up alone in the Mizzou parking lot, the old, you know, Windows up, smoke throughout the, and a cop patrolling there all the time. Anyway, got busted with that. Um, got busted with weed again the next year. The next year, got in trouble after he had, this was only eight days after he had uh, gotten busted with weed again, I think. He, you can't get busted with weed three times at Missouri. You, you're, it turned out much worse, but he, the guy didn't drink alcohol. And so he turned to alcohol, alcohol for his substance abuse, and it got much, much worse. According to police reports, forced his way into his girlfriend's home. Her friend was trying to stop him. He sort of shrugged her off, and she fell down the stairs. And then according to text messages from his girlfriend, he grabbed her by the neck and pulled her across the yard by her hair. I mean, some, that's what eventually got him kicked out. But it's this dude who had more talent than anybody in the country. I mean, he got kicked out of Mizzou. Went to Oklahoma for a year, never played because he couldn't get uh, back then. There was no real transfer portal um, and still got drafted in the second round. After all that, he only got two years of production and really a year of production because he didn't have much like that's the sort of talent. But you can't run away from that life. Those demons stay with you no matter how much this white family who I want to backtrack a little bit. Doriel, people kill me for this. I say all the time. He's an unbelievable kid. He's a great kid. He's got demons from his childhood. And so I imagine Michael Orr may be similar. 
I mean, Doriel is, he walked in the locker room as the highest rated recruit that you could ever possibly get. And he just wanted to be one of the guys, not an ounce of arrogance. He spent his time high because he probably wanted to forget what happened when he was in the fourth grade, in the seventh grade and all the stuff that he saw. And so that, that's sort of the conclusion I draw. This, I thought of this this morning when we were talking about the accusation that these people were just using him for money with Michael Orr. It's like, look, the Doriel Green Beckhams of the world, a great kid. I love this dude. That's far more likely to happen than the Michael Orrs of the world. And it's like, not only did the Tuies not need the money, but just the chance of this happening is so unbelievable. Even great kids like Doriel Green Beckham, that's the most likely outcome when you have that sort of upbringing. Yeah. The, you know, the more I think about this, TJ, and I'm, I'm going to let you go. Thank you for sharing that story. I, I wanted to share that with the audience. But the more I think about this, and, and I should have said this earlier, Michael Orr is trying to, si trying to promote a sequel to The Blind Side. Movie sequels are working from Top Gun Maverick to whatever. Sequels are working. Throwback movies. And Michael Orr's game plan in all of this is to promote a sequel to The Blind Side, and the, the real Blind Side. And he's going to be the star of that, or whoever plays him will be the star of that. And it will tell his whole backstory, and he's hoping he's got this second book coming out, or that has come out, and he's hoping someone will purchase that and turn it into a movie, and he's gonna cut a deal, and he's gonna make millions of dollars off of that, and he's drumming up attention. He's stepping on the backs of the Tuies to drum up attention for the sequel to The Blind Side. Make sure, what, what I just said there, let's cut that off, make that a clip, put it on social media. That, that, that's, that's my overall opinion on Michael Orr. He's trying to sell a sequel to the movie. He wants to get rich off that. I don't know how much money he's got left over, or maybe he just wants to make more money. Maybe he is still has plenty of money, but he's definitely trying to sell a sequel to The Blind Side. That's what this is all about. That's where the media needs to be looking. Steve Kim, The Korean Cosell, next. Hey, welcome back. Steve Kim, I want to start here with you. Uh, I want to play you uh, Case Smith reacting to the blind side story. And look, Case is, you know, one of the hot blondes that works for Barstool Sports. Uh, I don't know, I, I can't hold it to a real journalistic standard, but I will here anyway. I, I, I want to play, I want your reaction to her reaction to the Michael Orr story. Play the clip. Everybody's talking about the blind side right now and the fact that it just appears that the two E's are just bad people. If they actually lied to Michael Orr, teenager Michael Orr, and said that a conservatorship is the same as adopting him into the family, just straight up bad people. And I know we're gonna get into all the legal stuff as the story comes out, but my biggest question is, if this is all true, how are we just now finding out 14 years after the movie came out that Michael Orr is not making money off of it? That apparently the Tuies split it all four ways between their two biological children, and that Michael Orr was making no money off of a Hollywood blockbuster, $300 million. Sandra Bullock won the Academy Award for Best Actress from this, and we're just now figuring that out. And I guess there's the whole thought of like, oh, he was making all the NFL money, so maybe he didn't notice. What? Like, am I stupid? Do I not understand something? We're just now finding out this man was not making any money off of The Blind Side. It's not some indie film. Also, the movie's still good. And yes, like you can't watch it with the same lens. You probably can't ever really watch it again without feeling a little bit guilty. Again, if this is all true, it's still a good movie. And Sandra Bullock's still a queen. But how are we just finding that out? And if this is true, the Tuies are bad people. Bad. The parents, at least. The kids might not have known. I don't know. But this is crazy if this is all true. 
Okay. I, I just love how, how many of these accusations and allegations and do we just have to take at face value? Oh my God, a, a black guy said something bad happened. It must be true. Let me go post a video about it. I'm on his side. Why doesn't anyone ever just hit the pause button and say, well, let me see where this goes before I just start making random allegations? I, I mean, look, obviously she fit the looks quotient and uh, that young lady obviously had enough white guilt to get her hired, even at Barstool. Wow, a couple things here. That, that come to mind. Number one, I'm actually seeing on Twitter, and I, I know you commented on it, that people are now asking or wondering or demanding that Sandra Bullock give back her Oscar. Uh, folks, she was acting. doesn't matter if it's fiction or nonfiction. I mean, what is she, Reggie Bush with the Heisman? She gets to keep her Oscar, okay? <laughs> you could look at the movie in a different lens. or could have a different perspective of it. Don't care. The other thing is... Whether or not that there was an official paper that said, we are adopting you as parents or guardians, was there no value in the home structure, the roof over this young man's head, the advancing of his educational process, three square meals a day, helping him find structure in his life when his own family couldn't or would not? So you're just saying that a simple piece of paper or a signature, now again, if they were actually economically exploiting him, that's different. That has not really been proven yet. And now I'm hearing the two E saying, wait a minute, uh, simply not true. But this is the final and biggest point that I, I've come up with in this whole saga. They say that no good deed goes unpunished, but there's also the sin of ingratitude. So this is for all my Glacier Glider friends out there in America who want to adopt or want to take in somebody. Do it from a third world country. Don't do it with the Americans. They're not grateful. They're going to turn your back on them. So Laos, Vietnam, um, you know, some South American country, all these people are trying to get in, at least make one of them legal. Again, if you're going to adopt, do it from a third world country and maybe from Thailand. Teach them how to code. Don't let them play sports or football because now they might actually turn pro. And then now you got this issue. So again, to my fellow uh, Americans who are glacier gliders adopt from third world countries because they will express their gratitude and they will be thankful and you don't have to run into any of these issues. That's what I'm getting out of this whole thing. I, literally, I do think people are yes. going there mentally in terms of yes. just like Scott Adams, well ahead of the curve here. <laughs> I, I, I hate to say it, but it's just like, don't engage. It's not worth the risk. It, 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 anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of public opinion. Any deed you do can and will be used against you in the court of public opinion. You, you've nailed it. It's just like, hey, man, roof over your head, nice, safe home, bed to sleep in, clothes, bought you a car, cleaned up a, a, a lot of messes for you, medical care, all of it. And, and all you had to do, and again, I, I'm not even saying it was a quid pro quo, but you go to Ole Miss, their school, because I don't even think they put those kind of constraints on him. Because again, when the guy wanted to choose a different agent than their buddy Jimmy Sexton, in his own words, he, they didn't care, they didn't complain, they let him do it, this conservatorship, they weren't trying to force their will on him. They're, they're just using that. What do you think of my contention, Steve, that the real goal here is he's trying to sell his new book yeah. as the blind side 2.0. That's all this is about. The timing of it, and I don't want to be overly cynical, but I've questioned that. Like, what are you trying to sell? And then I, then I read, well, he's got a book. There you go. There's your answer. But, but let's go back here, all the way to the fact it's a young Michael Orr, above average size. Jason, do you really think the two he's looked at that kid and Sandra Bullock's character asked her husband, hey, honey, look at that kid's frame. About 6'5", probably going to be about 320. So here's what they probably did. Honey, you're right. Ed Orgeron may need a left tackle of the future in a couple of years. <laughs> um, let's invite him to a picnic. And so they invite him to a picnic, right? Everyone's having a good time. So, you know, they're having sandwiches and egg salad, potato salad, you know. 
They probably said to Michael, Michael, can you get into a three-point stance? And uh, can you do a shuffle? What's your kick? What's your drop step look like? You know, probably got a b- blocking sled and had it. I mean, really, you. So that's what they're. So these people just looked at this kid and ran an NFL combine. And they said, you know what? Let's take a gamble here. Forget that 4.0 student that has no ounce of athletic ability. We're going to we're going to get the kid. The, really? I mean, these people must have better skills or projection for NFL football players than Todd McShay or Mel Kuyper. I mean, give me a break. It, 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 Steve, and then the statistics would say that the chances of him making it to the NFL or the chances of him doing something criminal that gets him into trouble, given Uh-oh. his background, the neglect that, again, when you're a little kid, five, seven years old, and you're coming home every day and you don't know, well, is mama going to be there today or not? Will she lock the door and lock us out and we'll have to go find? The chances of that kid making it to the NFL or making it to a prison cell, it's the, the, the odds say prison cell well above NFL. And, and you can't convince me that the Tuies weren't smart enough to figure out like, man, this thing could skid off the road. But they took the risk, their Christian values, and per, maybe they're just sports fans. Hey, this will be great for the high school, and my kids are going to high school, and maybe he'll go to Ole Miss or whatever. But, but that father, who was a former college basketball player at Ole Miss, he's got to be smart enough to know, like, man, this is really high risk. This could spin out of control for me and my family. I... I just think what Michael Orr here is doing is despicable. What the media is doing, not looking at this with a skeptical eye. This is Jussie Smollett all over again. It's Bubba Wallace, and it's a guy trying to sell a book and a movie deal. And it's a guy who likely has financial problems that he's trying to fix by stepping on the neck and the back of people that did a favor for him. Steve, I want to move to uh, something a little more hardcore sports. Zeke Elliott signs a one-year deal with the New England Patriots. Dalvin Cook signs a one-year deal with the New York Jets. Uh, Who's going to have more success, Zeke Elliott with Bill Belichick or Dalvin Cook with Aaron Rodgers? All right, and Jason, are these guys running backs or rent-a-backs? But there's no doubt in my (laughs) mind, this is an easy question. Dalvin Cook. Dalvin can still cook. He still has his burners, and he's going to be – He's going to have much more offensive talent surrounding him. Hall of Fame quarterback, burgeoning all-pro wide receiver, a team with some explosiveness. They have team speed all over, right, with Garrett Wilson, McCole Hardman. I really like what they're going to do here, and he's going to play a specific role. He's not going to be the workhorse. Brees Hall, who had a very promising beginning to his NFL career last season before blowing out his knee, they're probably going to do it by committee. So I like that because now it gives another weapon because you could throw it out into the flat. You could run different routes because Dalvin can catch the ball a little bit, and he's a big play machine. Zeke Elliott's going to play a specific role in terms of being a short yardage goal line type of back. He's still good at it. If you look at his yards per carry, there's been an obvious decline. And with the Patriots, it's Ramon Stevenson that is their bellwether back. And I, I have some questions about the Patriots. They don't have a lot of weapons. I mean, Stanley Morgan, Irving Fryer, they ain't walking through that door. Um, And so it looks to me, based on the personnel that they have, and I know they got Juju Schuster, who's not really a field-stretching type of guy, it looks to me like, Jason, Belichick's going to go back to the hot tub time machine. They're going to play ball control type of offense, grind the clock, play 10 yards at a time, play field position, and that's where Zeke Elliott can move the chains here and there. But in terms of making a big impact, we're talking the splash plays, it's no doubt Dalvin Cook. Yeah, I, I, I Zeke has a lot to prove. Zeke has a new haircut and a mm. new attitude. He's been humbled. He's a really talented guy. But I think there's no tread left on the tires. Dallas has had a solid offensive line, and Tony Pollard – consistently was outplaying Ezekiel yeah. Elliott. I think the tread's off that tire 
Uh, I don't like New England's quarterback situation. Aaron Rodgers, chip on his shoulder, a lot to prove. Safety's afraid of Aaron Rodgers. Is going to create running lanes for Dalvin Cook. I'm with you. I think it's going to be Dalvin Cook. Uh, the NCAA, Steve, moving on, uh, has all these gambling issues. Yeah. And so I read uh, today that the Big Ten, with all of this expansion and these West Coast teams being added to the Big Ten, right. that they want, may want to play their Big Ten championship games occasionally in Las Vegas. And, and th this whole gambling thing is the most underreported story going on in college sports. And it's attached to name, image, and likeness. And the media has been so decimated and understaffed and no one does any investigation. But I've had coaches who know, coaches who matter, who have told me that this name, image, and likeness deal has put many of their players, basketball and football players, in direct contact with known gamblers. Because, again, the schools aren't monitoring these name, image, and likeness deals. The kids are out cutting their own deals. And so gamblers now have direct access to these athletes. This gambling thing in college sports and in professional sports, somewhat, for me, someone who has been a gambler uh, for a long time, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to bet on games this year because I, I, I don't trust the product. I, I, I really don't. I, you know, Tim Donahue and the referees bad enough. Now I, I, I authentically believe the players are in on it too. And so I don't think they're going to – and, and everybody just – it's just more money, more money. What gambling company, what gambling thing can we get involved with? This thing is a big, ugly, corrupt mess. What in the name of Arch Schleister is going on here? Uh, and, and by the way, how <laughs> ironic and funny would it be if the Iowa Hawkeyes made the uh, championship game in Las Vegas? I would literally put ankle bracelet monitors on every single player and take away their phone because we need to have a game that is above board. I'm with you. But, Jason, putting aside that aspect, which certainly is very troubling and strife with uh, conflict of interest, Here's another thing, and again, this is just the old-timer traditionalist in me, which I never thought I'd be, but here I am in 2023 uh, yelling at the sky. Uh, the fact that a Big Ten championship game would not be in the Midwest or anywhere close to Lake Michigan, but much closer to Lake Havasu um, in Las Vegas, Woody Hayes and Hayden Fry and Bo Schembechler and Bill Mallory – must be rolling over in their grave. I mean, I don't. I actually like the conference championship games, but I like the fact that they were kind of in that region of that conference, right? To a certain degree, like the ACC always had it in Charlotte for the most part. SECs had it in different areas, such as Atlanta and Birmingham. But now the reality is, there's no regionality in any of these conferences. So now, basically. You might have a game between, let's say, a very good Penn State team in the future against Michigan. And no, it's not going to be in Indianapolis at Lucas Oil. It's going to be at Allegiant Stadium. Tell me, I, I, I get it. It's about the branding. But unless that game, that particular year, has a UCLA or an SC and now or an Oregon or a Washington, doesn't that just seem like one of these boxing matches between two well-known American fighters in Saudi Arabia? Tell me what the difference is outside the geographic location of the continent. Tell me how that makes any sense for the fans. It makes no sense for the fans. It makes no sense for anybody. Uh, but tradition's out the window, and it's all about cutting a check, making a check, making as much money as possible. This, we've been on a 30-year collision course for all of this, and it all started with all of you guys that kept swearing that – College football's got to have a playoff. They got to have a playoff. Oh, there's there's, there's got to be a playoff. There's got to be a playoff. Hold on. Wait, that, I, that's what I, blew this great. whole thing up. We need a well, four-team playoff is perfect with the real conferences, with the regionals. I completely disagree. You're you're going a little far with that, there, Whitlock. Come on. Uh, let's move over to China very quickly. Uh, James Harden, 
is over in China. And he put Daryl Morey, former Houston Rockets general manager, now the general manager of the Philadelphia 76ers, put him on full blast. Let's watch the video of James Harden calling Daryl Morey a liar in China. Uh, Daryl Morey is a liar, and I will never be a part of an organization that he's a part of. Let me say that again. Daryl Morey is a liar, and I will never be a part of an organization that he's a part of. When it comes to these athletes, I'm making the same point I made about Michael Orr. Everything is always about making money. Everything. Everything that comes out of their mouth. It's not about honesty. It's always about the dollar. And so he's over in China. His NBA career is waning. He's on the decline. These athletes go over to China every offseason to make money. And that's why they're always afraid to criticize China. And they'll never say anything about China and they'll blast America. And so here's James Harden trying to build his brand in China, trying to sell Adidas shoes and become more valuable in China, putting Daryl Morey, who is hated in China because he's the only guy that ever spoke out against the abuse, the human rights abuses in China. This is just pandering for money in China. If he's over here in America, he doesn't say it. I don't, this, who, who knows? Maybe Daryl Morey has lied to him during their contract negotiations or whatever. He wouldn't be the first general manager to lie during a contract general uh, negotiation. James Harden's agents, they lie in contract negotiations. I find all of it phony. Yeah, you know, it's almost like the penalty for dealing with James Harden and bringing him inside your team and organization and believing in that is that you're stuck with him. And th th he, there's no doubt he was pandering in front of a bunch of crouching tigers, shout out to Oc Nation, and that he did it in, in a specific audience knowing he'd get no blowback, it would play well, and quite frankly, he wouldn't be locked up 90 days in jail in some sort of gulag. But with that said, th James Harden, I'm getting so sick. I've been sick of this guy. He's like the NBA version, and he's not the only one, of Holly Berry, as they say. There's a reason why Holly Berry, who's looking better and better, and James is getting worse and worse, so that's not the comparison. But there's a reason why Holly Berry is always with a different guy. And she's a great catch, you would figure, for a while. But there's a reason why there's a litany of exes from David Justice on and there's a bunch of other guys I don't remember. But he's the Holly Berry of the NBA. It looks enticing. It sounds good. You think you can make it work. This is going to be the one. And then two years later, you want to get rid of this bum. He's a perennial malcontent, but I also believe there's a deeper range, ranging issue here. It is personalities like him in incidents like this that turn off the general public to the NBA. These guys are not making millions, Jason. They're making tens of millions. And the average American who's just working to pay their bills, trying to work a double shift, after working Uber, already after working eight yards at the factory or the stockyard, they look at this and they just are completely turned off by this. And, and my view is this with Daryl Morey and even that young man, uh, Dame Lillard in Portland. They're treating him like a victim because a team is just still willing, the Portland Trailblazers. I don't know what he makes, but it's tens of millions. And somehow, get this, Jason, he's aggrieved. He's the victim if he's not traded, and if he's not traded specifically to the Miami Heat. Now, I will say this. If you'd made me stick around in Portland instead of Miami, I would cry out too. But think about it. I'm not getting paid $40, $50 million either. There comes a point where the NBA, and I don't think it's going to happen with Adam Aluminum, that wor the worst commissioner ever, right? Aluminum will never put his foot down. But the teams have to start saying, this is a contract. This is binding. We cannot find a better deal. You're not going anywhere, and you're going to act professional and do your job. Steve Kim, great job as always. Thank you so much. We'll see you tomorrow. We'll play tomorrow, and we'll see you tomorrow. Freedom, looking for a breakout, feeling like a standoff, nothing in life, like.
freedom Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder Making all this moves for freedom I want freedom No negotiation, my system, no relation We all just wanna have freedom Sitting on the corner, never been alone I'm breaking my back for freedom Bless, we are living, get back We are receiving, all receiving We all wanna be free We want freedom I just want, I wanna be I just want 